Starting off this countdown, we have the Weipholm experiments. This was a series of experiments in Sweden from 1945 to 1955. It's literally going to make you sick to your stomach when you find out what they did. Basically, they force-fed people with mental illness sweets to see if sugar was related to tooth decay. Imagine people just cramming food down your throat against your will. It's very gross. These experiments were conducted by the government and sponsored by the sugar industry. The experiments lasted for about two years, and by then, the teeth of about 50 of the subjects in the experiment had been completely ruined. In our ninth spot, we had the UK Special Demonstration Squad. This is the name of a group of undercover police officers in the UK. Now, the things that they did are going to shock you. For example, they would steal birth certificates and identities of people that had died at a young age. They'd make sure that they would be around their age and then use their identities. The younger the person died, the better, because that means they didn't already live a life that they would have to cover up. And then they would go around with this new identity. Some cases they actually got into relationships with women, but the whole time they did so just to spy on them. In November of 2015, the Metropolitan Police Force apologized to seven women tricked into relationships by these officers. Like imagine that, dating someone you're madly in love with, sometimes even having a kid with them, only for them to be like, oh, sorry, gotta go, was only dating you to get intel on you and your friend circle. It's disgusting, and it's actually happened to multiple women. In our eighth spot, we have the radioactive waste. Apparently, there's a huge radioactive dumping zone located in Tonawanda, New York. In fact, they dumped more than 37 million gallons of radioactive waste from their World War II atomic bomb tests. This area has a high rate of cancer and thyroid conditions, and this is the reason why, and no one's talking about it. In our seventh spot, we have the hepatitis tests. In 1956, the US government began running tests on young individuals living at the Willowbrook State School in Staten Island. This was a state-supported institution for children with intellectual disabilities. And what they did to these students was give them hepatitis in order to track the development of the viral infection. Of course, they were being experimented on without knowledge or consent. To make matters worse, the study lasted 14 years. They also injected them with a number of drugs to see what they would do to their body and the hepatitis. Imagine intentionally making a group of people sick for an experiment. The grossest part is that when the government was exposed for this project, they tried to justify their actions by saying that these people were probably going to wind up contracting it anyways. In our sixth spot today, we have Operation Popeye. This is another very wild one. Operation Popeye was a highly classified weather modification program during the Vietnam War from 1967 to 1972. You heard me correctly. The government learned how to control the weather. Basically, they wanted to increase rainfall in certain areas to prevent enemies and military supply trucks from being able to travel. In fact, they caused a number of landslides and flooding in that area. Weather manipulation has since been banned from use for military gain. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with HIV. In the 1980s, the HIV epidemic broke out. No one knew how it spread, they just knew that it should be feared, and tons of LGBTQ plus community members were sadly contracting the virus. Well, rumor has it that HIV was a government experiment that was meant to wipe out the undesirables. Of course, the US government has denied this claim, and it's just a conspiracy we don't know for sure. But based on the other experiments done on minority groups, it's hard to know what to believe. In our fourth spot today, we have Project 112 and Project SHAD, or S-H-A-D. Project 112 and Project SHAD took place from 1962 to 1973 and involved a number of veterans or military personnel. Basically, both tests involved exposing these people to substances they might want to use in warfare. Nearly 6,000 people were exposed to Coxiella burnetti, which is Q fever, Staphylococco enterotoxin B, which causes food poisoning, and sarin and somin gas. Sarin is a very, very dangerous nerve gas, and somin can cause death in minutes. Both can be fatal if only the tiniest amount gets on the skin. These men had no clue that they were being exposed to this. Moving on to number three, we have Project Sunshine. This is another very 
messed up government project. During the 1950s, the US government was using stillborns to conduct radiation tests on. They wanted to determine the effects that radiation would have on humans, and how much we could withstand in case of a nuclear fallout. They called this Project Sunshine, and it was anything but rainbows and sunshine. What's sad is that the government was stealing body parts and tissues from morgues, without families' consent. It's said that more than 1,500 samples were gathered worldwide. This is incredibly sad and sick. Coming in at number two, we have the syphilis experiments. In 1932, the US Public Health Service created an experiment to see the health effects of untreated syphilis. But the test subjects were told that they were receiving free treatment to cure their syphilis. And that was a lie. Instead of giving the men the recommended penicillin treatment, they gave them placebos, like aspirin. Sadly, 28 men died of syphilis because of these experiments, 100 more passed away from syphilis-related complications, and 40 spouses contracted this disease. And 19 women who gave birth passed on syphilis to their newborn children. In 1997, Bill Clinton apologized to the survivors and their families on behalf of the government. And he admitted that the tests were, and I quote, profoundly and morally wrong. And in our number one spot today, we have the radiation tests. In 1953, a number of tests were done on pregnant women to see the effects that radioactive iodine would have on them and their newborns. These studies were terrible. In one study, researchers gave these women doses of iodine-131. Sadly, they all miscarried. When they did, they continued to study the women's aborted embryos. Another study took place after World War II. 829 pregnant mothers in Tennessee were given vitamin drinks. They were informed that these drinks would improve their health and their babies. But it actually contained radioactive iron, and the researchers wanted to see how fast the radioisotopes crossed into the placenta. Several of the young passed away from these experiments. Four died from cancers as a result of the experiments, and the women experienced rashes, bruises, anemia, hair and tooth loss, and cancer as well. Meanwhile, they just wanted the best for their babies and thought that this drink was going to help them, not kill them. Starting off this countdown, we have the transmission tests. The US government once ran a series of tests on people with disabilities and prison inmates. They thought that it was fine to do so with this demographic of people because basically they thought they were going nowhere in life and they have nothing to lose. One of the tests in the mid 1940s was quite disgusting. It involved having young men swallow unfiltered stool. They did this to see how a deadly stomach bug was transmitted. The study took place at a reformatory prison, the New York State Vocational Institution. They claimed that they couldn't just spray the germs and have the test subjects breathe it in. No, no, no. They said that swallowing it was a more effective way to spread the disease. Of course, these men were forced to do so against their will and were left traumatized. In our ninth spot, we have the malaria tests. In the late 1940s, a group of men were infected with malaria before being starved for five days. While being starved, some of them were subjected to hard labor. Those men lost 14 pounds within a few days. They then were treated for their malaria with a number of drugs. What's wild is that this study was always kept a secret. In fact, most studies from the 1940s to 60s were never covered by the media. And if they were, the focus was, oh my God, the government might find a cure. It's amazing the work that they're doing. The focus was never on how they were finding the cure and their poor test subject. In our eighth spot today, we have the pregnant women. In the late 1940s, a number of researchers were testing diethylstilvestrol, which is a synthetic estrogen on pregnant women. They thought that this would help women against pregnancy complications, but it sadly did the exact opposite. A number of women ended up miscarrying or giving birth to low birth weight babies. None of the women knew that they were being experimented on in the first place. If they had known, they probably wouldn't have risked it. In our seventh spot, we have the syphilis experiment. In the early 1950s, the government controlled a syphilis study on men in Guatemala. Their aim was to find out how syphilis and other diseases spread. Sadly, not much is known about these experiments because the government records were destroyed years after the program was shut down in 1956. 
What we do know though is that the men were exposed to suits infected with this disease, but they later found that that didn't spread the infections quick enough. So they decided to inject the disease into the men. They did so by two ways. One, by making a medicine with this disease and putting it on their downstairs eggplant or by injecting it directly into their spine. What made this worse is that there were no age restrictions to these tests, so they were targeting the young too. Some declined drastically in health. Plus, a number of test subjects were left untreated so that they could study the progression of the infections as well as the damage it would cause. In our sixth spot, we have the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project is the project that produced the world's first atomic bomb. They conducted a number of tests, including detonating a series of bombs in a New Mexico desert. They also conducted a number of tests on humans to see the effects that radiation would have on us. One of the tests included monitoring nuclear technicians for the effects of radiation exposure. The technicians had no clue that they were being studied. Some fell extremely sick. One woman even suffered from kidney failure. That's when the workers began to wonder if they were getting sick from the radiation. Later, more tests were done on humans. This time, they were injected with polonium and other radioactive elements. In the end, hundreds of people ended up being injected or fed with plutonium, which is one of the most dangerous substances in the world. Sadly, they targeted individuals with disabilities. Over 57 children with disabilities and more than 100 adults with disabilities were injected with plutonium against their will. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the drug tests. Over the years, the government has sponsored a number of drug tests to see the effects that they have on humans. One involved a professional tennis player, Harold Blauer. In 1952, he died after being injected with a fatal dose of a hallucinogenic drug. The US Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, and the New York State Attorney General all worked together to conceal evidence of its involvement in this experiment. They did so for 23 years. They all denied having any part of this. They were like, oh, they, the army was injecting him with drugs? We had nothing to do with that. We didn't know. Yeah, right. In our fourth spot, we have LSD. Dr. Frank Olson was an American bacteriologist and biological warfare scientist that worked for the army and CIA. On November 28th, 1953, Frank died after falling out of a hotel in Pennsylvania. His death is quite controversial because we don't know what truly happened, but there are a lot of theories out there. So apparently on November 19th, Olson was given LSD without his knowledge or consent. Then just days later, he plummeted to his death. Many believe that the government had something to do with this. Either they were drugging him constantly and he became so delusional that he took his own life, or he was in too deep. Apparently days before his death, he attempted to resign. He even told his wife that he made a terrible mistake and then he mysteriously died. Suspicious, don't you think? In our third spot, we have mental health experiments. Dr. Robert Heath is quite the controversial figure in history, and that's due to the number of tests that he did on patients with schizophrenia. In the studies funded by the US Army, he would dose the patients with LSD before implanting electrodes into their brain and shocking them. He thought that this would cure all their problems. He also would use this on gay men to try and make them straight. In our second spot, we have the monster experiment. In 1939, psychologist Wendell Johnson and his student Mary Tudor conducted something known as the monster experiment. For this, they used 22 young orphans. Now, the study was all about stuttering. They wanted to see if psychological abuse could induce stuttering in children. And turns out, it did. So for this test, they divided the orphans into two groups. One group, the children were praised and treated humanely. In the other group, they were treated the complete opposite. In the end, the children in the negative group developed stutters that they retained for the rest of their lives. And in our number one spot today, we have the mustard gas experiments. In the early part of World War II, it was feared that Germany was going to turn to chemical warfare. So the US Army wanted to be prepared. One way that they prepared was by studying the effects of mustard gas. So they gathered a number of healthy young men who volunteered. 
However, had they known what they were going to go through, chances are they wouldn't have volunteered. 1,200 volunteers were tested in small teams for several weeks. They were ordered to strip to the waist and then were sent into a chamber and doused with mustard gas. According to one survivor, and I quote, all of the men began writhing around and screaming in pain as the chemical burned through their skin. Some pounded on the walls and demanded to be let out, though the doors were locked and only opened when the time was up. Now, mustard gas causes nasty, nasty burns to the skin, and it can also cause uncontrollable bleeding in the lungs if it's inhaled. Now, the men did receive treatment after the experiment, but they were threatened. They said that if they told anyone about these experiments, then they were going to be sent to military prison. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Operation Northwoods. This is an operation that comes from the time of the Cold War, and it has to do with the tense relationship that was seen between the United States and Cuba at the time. This is the first time we will be talking about this tense relationship on this list, but it won't be the last. Operation Northwoods, should it have gone forward, would have been a project that saw violence committed against the US and Cuban civilians, with the blame placed on the Cuban government. Messed up, right? These acts would include faked attacks of a high magnitude, the hijacking of planes, the sinking of boats, like really serious stuff. They wanted to do this in order to justify an all-out war with Cuba, but thankfully some people at the time had decided that this likely wasn't the smartest or the best route to take, and the idea was scrapped. For a long time, this was hidden from the public until years later documents were revealed that showed this dark, dark truth. In our number 9 spot today, we have Psychic Driving. Part of the famous Project MK Ultra, this experiment was conducted by British psychiatrist Donald Ewan Cameron, who created the psychic driving concept that the CIA found interesting. Basically, psychic driving was a procedure that subjects patients to a continuous, repeated audio loop of something that is intended to change their behavior. Basically, the patients would be exposed to hundreds of thousands of repetitions of a singular statement through the course of their treatment, and they would also be subjected to paralytic drugs that would subdue them while being exposed to this looped message. Yeah, so the CIA heard about this idea for a treatment and they thought, hmm, that sounds cool, and they started sending money to fund Cameron's experiments, but he actually didn't know it was coming from the CIA because they used a front. So Cameron's psychic driving experiments for MK Ultra began to take place in Canada. I guess they said that the aim of the experiments were to get rid of, or cure, someone of schizophrenia by erasing existing memories and reprogramming the psyche. I'm not sure that's how schizophrenia works, but I guess they did. Cameron would subject patients to LSD paralytic drugs, and electroconvulsive therapy that was 30 to 40 times the normal power. He would also put the experiment subjects into drug-induced comas while exposing them to the repetitive audio. The experiments were mostly conducted on patients who entered the institute for more common problems like anxiety disorders or postpartum depression, and they ended up leaving with permanent effects from his actions. These included things like urinary incontinence, amnesia, being unable to speak, some people forgot their parents and thought that the interrogators were their parents, it clearly completely altered those who were participating in these horrible and certainly unethical experiments, all up until the experiments ended up being scrapped. In our number 8 spot today, we have Operation Wash Tub. This operation came to light in 2014 when documents became declassified and more people could learn about this Cold War era operation. Basically, this was a covert mission that had its sights set on Alaska. The plan detailed the training of different people who lived in Alaska. Like, we're just talking ordinary residents. They wanted to train these people to both code and decode and a few other like cool spy tactics. I mean, I would have wanted to be picked so badly. Not that I would have even known it was happening, but you get what I mean. Like, real life spy mission? No problem, I'm in. Basically, the plan was put in place in case the Soviet Union was to invade Alaska, but then these unsuspecting ordinary citizens would use their newly learned espionage techniques to get all the intel they could and secretly relay the information to high-ranking US officials. As we now know, of course, this invasion never occurred, so the contingency plan wasn't needed, but 89 lucky temporary agents were trained just for this purpose what I would give to be one of them. In our number seven spot today, we have Operation Midnight Climax. This experiment took place in the 1950s and it was one of those mind control research projects that was sponsored by the CIA. We've already talked about one. So basically they wanted to study the effects of LSD, but instead of finding willing participants, which let's be honest, 
probably wouldn't have been that difficult, but instead they used non-consenting people who were lured to safe houses by sex workers who were being paid by the CIA, and then once at these safe houses, they were slumped the drug and monitored from behind a one-way glass. For over a decade, the project gave the government more knowledge about the drug itself and what it does to the mind, it gave the knowledge about surveillance technology, and even blackmail. In the end, the project was shut down in 1965 because, uh, I don't really have to explain that one, do I? In our number six spot today, we have medication. This is something that is actually seen in military prisons or detention centers such as Guantanamo Bay. Basically, this is more of a practice rather than like an experiment or an operation, but it's the force feeding of illicit or psychoactive chemicals to prisoners, some of whom are then interrogated afterwards. I absolutely do not have to explain why this is unacceptable practice, as it is not only a violation of medical ethics, but also a violation of human rights. Many times, these sorts of chemicals are given without the prisoners being aware of what it is, and sometimes not even being aware that they are ingesting it at all. There was a huge scandal about this one when documents became declassified, and it was released that this was something that was going on at Guantanamo Bay. Some of those being kept here were dosed with a heavy psychoactive medication that is known to make a person groggy, and then subjected to interrogations afterwards. In our number five spot today, we have Project Horizon. Even before people were going to space, we had big goals in mind for the world of space travel. In 1959, there were plans for a proposed manned military base that would be located, of course, on the moon. This plan, which was dubbed Project Horizon, would, quote, develop and protect potentially United States interest on the moon, as said in now declassified documents. It was estimated at the time to cost about $6 billion, and the projected operational date was December of 1966, which is when they thought that they could have 12 soldiers on base by. The project not only wanted to study more about the surface of the moon, but what better of a place to spy on Earth than our friendly little neighbor up there in the sky. This project, of course, never came to fruition, and the reason it stopped progressing was because the president at the time, Dwight Eisenhower, rejected it at the same time that the responsibility for America's space program was being transferred over to NASA. In our number four spot today, we have heavy consideration. Presidential duties certainly are not easy, and making big, important decisions is likely a very nerve-wracking experience that you'd probably want as much information as possible for. That is exactly exactly why, around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Maxwell Taylor wrote a memo at the request of the then President John F. Kennedy. The memo was requested because Kennedy wanted to know what the human cost would be of invading Cuba. The declassified memo explained that should Cuban forces use conventional weapons and not tactical nukes, that Quote, our medical plans are drawn up to accommodate up to 18,500 casualties in the first 10 days of this operation. He then also goes on to explain that if these tactical nuclear weapons were in fact used, that, quote, there is no experience factor upon which to base an estimate of casualties. That is absolutely terrifying. The number they could estimate is already more than terrible enough. I truly don't even want to hear the next one. And this is just a glimpse into what the outcome could have been should these sorts of plans have actually gone forward. In our number three spot today, we have Project Minaret. This is a document that became declassified in 2013 as a part of the National Security Archives efforts. This historical document describes a sort of watch list of prominent Americans who were critical of the Vietnam War. The document explains that their overseas communications were tapped and listened into by the government from 1967 to 1973, and a quote from the document reads, quote, President Johnson wanted to know if the domestic anti-war movement was receiving help from abroad. The project expanded so much that it went on to include more than 1,600 people, including civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Whitney Young, and Muhammad Ali. There were also people like Democratic U.S. Senator Frank Church of Idaho, Republican Senator Howard Baker of Tennessee, New York Times columnist Tom Wicker, and Washington Post humor columnist Art Butchwald. But it continued on through to the Nixon administration. In the end, the only reason it was stopped was because Attorney General Elliot Richardson was concerned about its very doubtful and murky legality and decided during the Watergate scandal that it would be best to shut it down. I mean, 
they definitely had enough on their plate already at the time, okay? In our number two spot today, we have Project 1794. This project was created with the goal to build a sort of saucer-type aircraft that would be designed to shoot down Soviet bombers. The program, which was created in the 1950s, was quite ambitious and had some pretty lofty goals. A team of engineers began trying to build a disc-shaped aircraft, but here's the real kicker. They wanted it to be capable of traveling at supersonic speeds at high altitudes. The documents about this project showed that they wanted it to be able to travel at Mach 4, which is four times the speed of sound, and they wanted it to be able to reach an altitude of over 100,000 feet. At the time, the project was estimated to cost about $3 million, which is about $26 million today. In the end, the project was cancelled in 1961 because the craft failed tests and proved to be aerodynamically unstable, which of course would provide a whole slew of problems at high speeds especially supersonic ones. In our number one spot today, we have Acoustic Kitty. This is one that I've talked about before and I'm talking about it again because I just can't believe that it happened. Apparently, in 1967, the CIA was spending millions of dollars trying to make cats into spies. I don't know why they chose the animal that does not care what you want it to do, but alas, they did, and Project Acoustic Kitty was born. The project basically involved implanting electronic spy equipment into real living cats who would then be trained to basically eavesdrop on unsuspecting people. This is another one of those Cold War era plans that was intended to be used on those in the Soviet Union. The project had a whole slew of issues, of course, however, because cats get hungry and distracted, and unfortunately the first time this plan was being tested, there was a catastrophic outcome. No pun intended. I just said catastrophic. Get it? The project, of course, is cancelled and the researchers said that they believed they could train cats to move short distances, but that, quote, the environmental and security factors in using this technique in a real foreign situation forces us to conclude that for our intelligence purposes, it would not be practical. And I think that was probably a very good decision. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have Diolkos. The Diolkos is honestly an unbelievable creation and it was kind of like the world's first railway. In ancient Greece, near Corinth, those living in the area at the time created a paved trackway that allowed boats to be moved over land across the isthmus of Corinth. This created a huge and convenient shortcut that was commonly used to transfer goods, but in the times of war, it also helped to speed up naval campaigns. This trackway allowed them to avoid the long and dangerous circumnavigation of the peninsula. The rudimentary railway was used from 600 BC until the middle of the very first century AD. Not only did this literally pave the way for railways and overland ship transports to come, but it was also totally unique in its time, which is so fascinating. I'd be so mad if I was the last guy who had to go around the peninsula though before the trackway was created. In our number nine spot today, we have the Metropolitan Sepulcher. I don't know how to say that word, I'm gonna be honest. Okay, this one isn't exactly ancient, but it is a proposed mega project from a long time ago, and it's absolutely wild, so I couldn't wait to include it on this list. Basically, in 19th century London, everyone was like, wow, People die a lot. Where are we gonna put all the bodies? Well, great question, everyone. As it turns out, the answer for some people was to build a huge death pyramid. This mega project was a massive pyramidal necropolis that was proposed for construction in Primrose Hill. It was designed by the architect Thomas Wilson, and it was intended to be 90 stories high and capable of holding up to 5 million bodies. There also would have been an astronomical observatory at the pyramid's peak, but there's something about passing 5 million bodies that would probably ruin anyone's appetite for looking at the stars. In the end, the $7 million project was never built, and instead there was a creation of garden cemeteries throughout the city. In our number 8 spot today, we have Gran Cavallo. Also known as Leonardo's horse, this was a sculpture that the Duke of Milan commissioned Leonardo da Vinci to make for him in 1482. This wasn't just any sculpture, however. It was intended to be the largest equestrian statue in the entire world, and it was meant to be a monument to the Duke's father. Da Vinci did a ton of research and preparation for this creation, and even made an enormous clay model of it as well, which was displayed to the public. Before it could be casted in bronze, however, the French had invaded Italy, and the Duke used the bronze that was intended for the horse, and instead dedicated it to be used to cast cannons instead. Sadly, when the city fell, the clay model horse was used as an archery target by the French soldiers, and it was destroyed. Although this project was never completed, five centuries later, his surviving design materials were used as the base as people began trying to carry out these 
unfinished plans. In our number 7 spot today we have a Moose Cavalry. This one is hotly debated on whether or not it really happened, but I wasn't there and I know you weren't there either, and some sources claimed that this happened, so we're still gonna talk about it. It is said that King Charles XI of Sweden got sick and tired of importing horses, but of course needed a replacement for them. What better for a horse replacement than the extremely unsimilar and alarmingly large moose? Apparently a cavalry, a military unit of moose, was actually trialed for a while. This wasn't necessarily the weirdest thing in the world because moose had actually been used in Sweden to draw the sleighs of royals, and they were great and super efficient at that job. But moose are simply not going to run toward gunfire. That's the major caveat of a moose cavalry, and I have to say, it's a pretty big one. Honestly, those moose had no idea, but their good instincts saved them from a life of work and taxes. In our number six spot today, we have Xerxes pontoon bridges. These bridges were constructed in 480 BC during the second Persian invasion of Greece upon the order of Xerxes I. The purpose of these bridges were for Xerxes' army to transverse the Hellespont from Asia into Thrace. The Hellespont had extremely strong currents which switch up their direction, they're often turbulent in stormy waters and violent winds. Here's the thing about these bridges. We know that building them was a unique achievement, but we truly don't have a lot of information about them or how they were built. It is said that the bridges were around 2,000 meters in length and that there were two of them. Unfortunately, they ended up being destroyed in a storm, and you know what Xerxes' response to that was? He had all those responsible for building the bridge beheaded. People probably didn't want to work for him after that, I'd imagine. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Siege of Masada. The Siege of Masada took place in 73 AD after the fall of Jerusalem, and it was one of the final events of the first Jewish Roman War. The event took place on and around a large hilltop in what is now current day Israel, but here's where the mega project comes in. The Romans began to build a massive earth ramp on the western side of the fortress of Masada. They managed to build it all while under the constant fire from those defending the area, and it was still just under 2,000 feet long, and it rose up 200 feet in the air. After building this ramp, they then managed to push a siege tower up the ramp. This ramp does mostly still exist, and basically Basically what they ended up doing was like extending the side of the mountain that Masada was built on. It is absolutely insane that they did all of this just to capture people. Like all of that for 960 people? Imagine if we had ancient Romans now. Suddenly all of our cities would actually be inclusive and accessible. Ramps for all. In our number 4 spot today we have Atlantropa. Sometimes referred to as Panropa, this was an idea that honestly seems like it should be taken straight out of a sci-fi novel. This was a huge engineering plan that was created by a German architect. Architect Hermann Sorgel. Basically, the idea was to place several dams in key points in the Mediterranean Sea, like the Strait of Gibraltar. This would then cause a major sea level drop, which the entire point of this thing, according to Hermann, was so that this would then reveal new land to settle on. While there were some supporters of this project and Hermann actively worked on it and the plans for it right up until his death, this is one that never came to fruition and likely never will. In our number three spot today, we have the Colosseum. This one hasn't exactly been forgotten about, but it really was a mega project that was certainly abandoned. I'm sure most of us have heard of the Colosseum before, but if you didn't know, it used to be flooded in order to host naval battles. Imagine waiting for that bathtub to fill up. Once filled, the ships would come out and it was like the sea world of the underworld. Sometimes instead of gory battles, there would be shows at the Colosseum, like a group of nude synchronized swimmers. Once the success of these events was realized, the emperor just decided to devote an entire lake to them instead. From here, non-water activities took over the stage and they used Use the old floodgates to hide animals in. Early medieval era, this area stopped being used for entertainment and instead began to be used for housing, workshops, and religious situations. But now, due to earthquakes and stone robbers, most of the Colosseum is in ruins, and it is now a really popular tourist attraction. In our number two spot today, we have the Hidden Chamber. One of the most fascinating ancient mega projects of all times are the ones that actually exist all over, and we have unearthed quite a few. Yeah, I'm talking about those crazy, cool, unbelievable tombs and necropolises. Those things are fascinating. People are buried in places that are nicer than the one I live in. That's wild. Ancient Egyptian architecture is truly like nothing else in the world, and every day we learn more about the secrets of the past. Queen Nefertiti is high on the list of fascinating figures from the times of ancient Egypt, and there might just be an ancient mega project waiting to be uncovered when it comes to her. It is believed that hidden away in King Tut's tomb, remember that guy? Yeah, they think that in his tomb there is a hidden chamber in there, and they think that that might be where Queen Nefertiti is. This is like the most insane discovery of the 21st century. 
country. After radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials are like 90% sure that they found a hidden chamber that also just happens to be full of treasure. It is actually thought that, although we refer to it as King Tut's tomb, it might actually be Queen Nefertiti's tomb. King Tut only died when he was 19 years old. He died before she did, which no one was expecting to happen, so if they already had a full tomb ready for this guy, I'd probably be a little suspicious if I was him. In our number one spot today, we have the Corinth Canal. Remember that ancient trackway we started this list off with? Well, we're going to talk about another ancient mega project in the exact same location to end this list off with today. We've come full circle. Let's do it. The Corinth Canal was very first proposed in the 7th century BC, but the idea was abandoned because of the trackway we already talked about. See? Full circle. Look at us retaining knowledge and using it to inform us on other things. The first failed attempt to build it took place in the 1st century AD, and basically it was intended to connect the Aegean Sea to the Ionian Sea. These plans were tried many times in ancient times, but to no avail, and surprisingly, in the 1800s, the idea began to be picked up again. After many financial and operational difficulties, the canal was actually completed in 1893. Unfortunately, the canal is quite difficult to navigate for any kind of larger vessels, so it's mostly used by smaller recreational boats. If the spirits of any ancient Greeks still exist around here, they're probably so happy it finally got done. Imagine watching everyone fail at it for all those years. I'm just saying, it probably felt good. Number 10, Project Stargate. If you've watched Stranger Things, then this one probably sounds familiar to you. In the show, Eleven started off as an experiment to psychically spy on the Russians, and turns out, this was actually real. In the 1970s in California and later in Maryland, the CIA recruited numerous men and women who claimed they had ESP or extrasensory perception. People with ESP typically say that they can read minds or move objects without touching them. They were recruited to try and help uncover military and domestic intelligence secrets. Mostly they just wanted them to spy on the Russians by reading their minds. The government covered it up of course because why would they want want people knowing they're trying to use magic powers to win a war. But in 2017, when 12 million pages of records were declassified, all of the information about the so-called Project Stargate became public knowledge. People learning that they had been using the men and women to locate hostages and even track fugitives throughout the states. Number 9. Vault 7 Vault 7 was definitely never meant to make it to the public eye, but unfortunately for the CIA, it got leaked. So what actually is Vault Vault 7. Back in 2017, WikiLeaks started releasing a series of CIA documents. Vault 7 was a group of documents that contained hacking systems that were either developed or otherwise obtained by the CIA. For the most part, it should make you wary of your technology and how the government is using it. Many people know that apps will track our searches and data to learn about us and maybe even sell it to malicious companies, but it's much more than that. Weeping Angel has the ability to turn a Samsung television into a recording device, even if it appears that your television is switched off. Vault 7 also contained the ability to intercept all your iPhone messages before they got encrypted through apps like WhatsApp, Signal, and Telegram. And according to the documents, the CIA can allegedly take over your phone by exploiting vulnerabilities, but Apple has said that they patch these vulnerabilities as soon as they're aware of them. Number 8. Battalion 316 Intelligence Legends Battalion 316 went through a few different names throughout its existence, but it was pretty much always functioning for the same reason. They were an army unit in Honduras that was responsible for carrying out political assassinations, and even kidnapping and causing pain to people who were seen as potential political competition throughout the 1980s. The group received both support and training from the CIA, even receiving their training at United States military bases. They were a military kill squad that definitely wasn't known for being friendly, committing various crimes like terrorism, misogyny, ethnic cleansing, and even so-called crimes against humanity. Their goal to remain in power in Honduras failed, leaving behind a long list of innocent victims. In 1996, members of the US Congress asked President Bill Clinton to release the documentation about the country's involvement with the human rights violations that took place in Honduras, and this is when we learned about the battalion. Number 7. MK Ultra. Let's once again return to the Red Scare and the United States fight against Russians and communism. During the Cold War, they came under the belief that the communists had invented a drug that would allow them to control human minds, and the US wanted a piece of that. Starting their own research into the technique, 
under the name Project MK Ultra, trying to find their own mind control substance that could be turned into a weapon. It ran from the 50s to the 60s and led to many unknowing or even unwilling subjects being given illicit substances. The experiments were apparently covertly funded in American universities and research facilities, but it turns out that the experiments also took place in prisons and detention centers in the US, Japan, Germany, and the Philippines. The goal was to destroy the current mind and replace it with something new. Attempts included using electric shocks and illicit substances. For some, the experiments were fatal and many others had their lives completely changed. Number 6. Operation Cyclone Operation Cyclone became known as one of the longest and most expensive covert operations taken on by the CIA, costing around $630 million per year for a whole decade. So what was Operation Cyclone and why was the government pouring so much cash into it? It was an operation that worked to arm and finance militant Islamic groups during the military intervention by the USSR. The goal was to aid anti-Soviet resistances outside of the United States. They gave loans, aircrafts, weapons, and other military assistance to the groups in Afghanistan, costing the United States government billions of dollars for these so-called care packages. Eventually, the Soviets were pushed out of Afghanistan, but conspiracy was still spinning. Many of the weapons ended up being sold in local markets instead of going to the rebels, and some people believe that Osama bin Laden and the Al Qaeda received assistance from the US military. Number 5. Operation Ajax In the 1950s, a coup took place in Iran, and the CIA documents about it weren't released until they were pressured to a total 64 years later. As it turns out, the agency played a large role in the coup that led to the end of the current Iranian Prime Minister, a rise in nationalism, and sour US-Iranian relationships remaining into the 21st century. The motivation was oil. The US and UK wanted Iran's oil, but their new prime minister made it inaccessible to them. So the two countries conspired to overthrow him and get the oil back. The coup seemed to fail, and the CIA sent a message to their base in Iran calling it off. But the CIA officer who received it said, nah, we're not done here. So the next day, with crowds allegedly hired by the CIA, the coup or or Operation Ajax went through and the Prime Minister was overthrown. The monarchy and oil fields restored in the country. Anti-Western sentiment also being restored and growing to new and extreme levels. Number 4. The Five Eyes Are you familiar with one of the farthest reaching intelligence and espionage agencies in the world? You are probably a part of it and don't even know it. It is the once secret Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. After World War II, the US and UK came together to create an information sharing alliance, as a result of how important communication was for them during the war effort. And in 1956, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand were added to this group. The classification status on these documents was USA, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, eyes only. And that was obviously a bit wordy, so they shortened it down to five eyes. It has been operating for 70 years now and is used for surveillance and sharing classified information between the five countries. The alliance was especially important during the Cold War when the countries shared a lot of information like the location of Soviet weapons in North America. The alliance was kept a secret until documents of the original UK and USA agreement were released back in 2010. Number 3. Operation PB Success Similarly to Operation Ajax, Operation PB Success was a covert CIA military operation that took place in another country, this time Guatemala. This was another coup that took place only a year after the one in Iran in 1954. At the time, Guatemala had a very new democracy, only being on their second democratically elected president. But the United States saw him as a threat, this being due to his allowance of the Guatemalan Communist Party to act freely and land reform movements that threatened US industries. The CIA then worked through various different plans of action to overthrow the Guatemalan government, including assassination and faking tensions between the country and Honduras. They spread false information, placed anonymous phone calls, and hired anti-communist students to create a fake opposition. Eventually, the president stepped down and their democracy was seen as unfavorable. The United States training that the Guatemalan military now had led to a war lasting decades, tearing apart the country. But PB success was a success as it worked, and they were able to deny 
CIA involvement until the documents were released in 1997. Number 2 The Secret War We're once again fighting communism, this time in Vietnam. But while the Vietnam War was taking place, a smaller secret war was taking place in Laos, attempting to stop communism from spreading to Southeast Asia. The Americans essentially used the countries of Laos and Cambodia to fight their own war against northern Vietnam and communism, using their tribes as their soldiers. While it was clear that the small armies had no hopes of truly winning against northern Vietnam, the United States and the CIA continued on with their fight, devastating the country and peoples of Laos and Cambodia. They came out of the war with their land and lives completely lost and changed, but the CIA wrote it down in their history books as a success, disregarding the country's sacrifice. The CIA's historical retrospective on the situation not being released until many years later. Number 1. Operation Condor It's the Cold War again and the United States government are fighting against terrorism, this time under the code name Operation Condor. It was a campaign of political repression and so called state terror that was backed by the US and CIA. It involved many heinous activities like kidnapping, killings, political espionage and much more, all taking place throughout South America. The CIA chose to describe it as a cooperative effort by the intelligence slash security services of several South American countries to combat terrorism and subversion, but really it was a lot more than that. Condor's key members were Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia and later Brazil. The United States provided them with planning, coordination, technical support and military training all routed through the CIA. It led to many military dictatorships and numerous deaths throughout South America. And there is so much detail and information on this one that if you want it, you're just going to have to look it up for yourself. Number 10, Wilhelm Reich's Cloudbusters. I don't even I don't even know how to begin this one. The experiments of Wilhelm Reich believed to have the answer as to why the sky was blue. His reason? Because it was so damn sexy. Reich was heavily influenced by Freud's work on the human libido and believed that he could relate human orgasms to the weather. He proposed a widespread kind of energy called organ. You might have heard of organite. Organ was everywhere, and Reich said he could measure this energy in motion across the earth. His description literally sounds like the force from Star Wars, but like sexy. He believed that when people had orgasms, they discharged their energy, which if harnessed, could be used to treat diseases like cancer. Ridiculous. In the 1950s, he went so far as to involve aliens as he believed they were spraying the earth with some kind of radiation that inhibited the orgasm energy. So he made the cloudbuster with his son, which essentially was a row of tubes attached to hoses immersed in water aimed at the sky. It was supposed to absorb the radiation and make it rain, which happened once. Many believe it was just a coincidence. Did it work? We may never know. Right or wrong, we will never know. They ordered Reich's various machines and apparatuses to be destroyed and had him jailed for trying to smuggle them out of state. Number 9, 10 Cent Beer Night. In Ontario, Canada, we are all too familiar with people making stupid decisions for a buck a beer. If you're curious to search on Google uh, buck a beer, you'll know. I'll admit this one isn't all mysterious, but it was too funny not to include. The 10 cent beer night was an experiment that took place in 1974, orchestrated by the Cleveland Indians. They wanted to increase game attendance, so they introduced a 10 cent beer promotion. You could have as much beer for as only 10 cents a glass. As you can guess, the worst idea ever. Needless to say, the stadium was packed with those enticed by the promotion. Their game against the Texas Rangers included a whole lot of nudity and botchery. The game included at one point a woman running into the Indians on deck circle and flashing the umpire. Then there was a naked fan running onto the field sliding into second base. And a father and son duo who ran onto the outfield and mooned the bleacher section. Yeah. Fans started launching fireworks into the Rangers dugout resulting in an all out riot. They ended up abandoning the promotion only to bring it back later with a limit of two per person. I mean I guess it worked. It's not mysterious but it's funny so I hope you laughed. Number 8 Henry A. Murray this is sadly the real life version of Clockwork Orange, if you've ever seen that movie. <gasps> Henry A. Murray was a psychologist who may have been responsible, part, for Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Ted 
was an undergrad at Harvard in the 1950s and 60s and participated in a three year study with Murray. Murray was trying to explore the effects of stress on the human psyche. Ted, along with 21 other students, were asked to write an essay about their worldview and their personal philosophies. After which, they were interrogated under bright lights, wired to electrodes, and completely torn down. Like they were torn to shreds. These were the kind of techniques they were planning to use on the enemies during the Cold War. So, in other words, he was psychologically tormented. Ted even said it was the worst experience of his life. Apparently, Ted was already quite an emotional mess before this all started, so it's pretty certain that he had already had a good foundation for what he would do later. However, today, this study is considered highly unethical. Ethical and would never be done again. Or so we think. Number seven, the Stanford prison experiment and how it started funny and now it's going ooh, down, really dark, no light here. I don't know who thought this would be a good idea or even containable, but hey, it happened. The Stanford prison experiment was a social psychology study that went totally off the wall in 1971. The US Naval Research Office wanted to explore the effect of role playing and social expectations. The argument was that situations and circumstances affect how people act, not the people themselves. 24 men were assigned either the role of prison guard or inmate, a kind of grown up cops and robbers game. They were paid $15 an hour, now Ontario's minimum wage, to participate in the study. They committed so hard that by only the second day, the prisoners revolted. Some were even pulled out entirely because it was too much. It all got so bad that it was finally abandoned after six days when an outside observer was like, dude, the no, this is not okay. This is not okay. Can we end this? Makes one certainly guess all those advertisements saying, get money to be a subject for this new scientific study. <laughs> Ugh, what is it gonna be? Number six, Red Frankenstein. We know humans and chimps are pretty close relatives, but we are still wholly different beings. But to Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov, didn't seem to think so, and in fact wanted to bring us that much closer together. Mostly known for his contribution to artificial insemination, which is a very good thing, it's a good thing, Ivanov also had other plans. By the scientific community, he was known as Red Frankenstein due to his desire to fuse humans with an ape. Despite controversy in the scientific community, Ivanov got the all clear to head to Africa to collect specimens. At first, he artificially inseminated female chimps with human sperm, and then later, the other way around. Obviously, he never succeeded because it was like, guys, this isn't a good idea. But imagine if he had? Terrifying. Thankfully, the project was abandoned, but can you believe that the same guy who revolutionized insemination tried to do this? Actually, kind of, yes, I can. Number five, Cola Super Deep Hole. Human beings certainly love exploring the stars, the ocean below us, but curiosity still remains for what's beneath our feet. A few countries have attempted to get to the center of the Earth, but the Soviets actually managed to get the furthest. From 1970 to 1994, they drilled on the Kola Peninsula and created the deepest hole in the world, extending 7.5 miles into the Earth. However, the project was forced to stop in the early 1990s when they encountered unexpectedly high temperatures. At the bottom hole, they reached temperatures of 180 degrees Celsius, which is 356 degrees Fahrenheit, a drastic difference than anyone expected. The rock was more like melted plastic than rock and impossible to cut through. But other worries about causing earthquakes or even splitting the earth are rumored to be another reason for why the mission was completely stopped. Number four, Midnight Climax. Operation Midnight Climax would not be considered at all ethical by any standards of today. God, I hope so. But it does make you wonder how much is happening behind closed doors. Midnight Climax was one of the CIA's, oh, the CIA, most controversial abandoned projects of the past. Tensions were high during the Cold War, and the idea of mind control was too good a tactic not to try and develop. So in the 1950s, the CIA started Operation Midnight Climax. The aim was to research the effects of psychedelics like LSD to see if they could use that to somehow form an extra kind of persuasion. Their unconsenting subjects followed women of the night under their payroll who dosed them with LSD unknowingly. They set up warehouses in San Francisco and NYC to monitor the cases through one-way glass. So essentially like the red light district in Amsterdam, but with CIA funding. With the project being a weird observance of people doing the nasty, the warehouses were shut down in 1965 after the project was discovered. Number three, unit 731. So here we go, we're in the top three. It gets really dark from here on in. Just a fair warning to all of you. 
If you thought the experiments in the Holocaust were bad, you're right. They were awful, no exceptions there. But did you know that over in Japan they were doing some evil experiments of their own and of the same caliber in Unit 731? The unit was run by Shiro Ishii, an evil genius driven to perform the worst of humanity. Ishii, along with everyone working at Unit 731, performed horrifying, horrifying experiments to test out disease and biological warfare. The cruel experiments on prisoners of war and Chinese civilians in their encampments would make your stomach churn. They performed live vivisections and infected them with a variety of diseases on top of making them go through hypothermia, frostbite, induced strokes and heart attacks. But this is where things get extra seedy and is probably something the US doesn't like talking about. After the war, Ishi was never punished. He was never persecuted. Instead, the US traded his freedom for all of the information he gathered from his experiments. So on one hand, that makes me sick. And on the other, I am hopeful that the information is being used for good and the dead didn't die in vain. Number two, the two-headed dog experiment. This sounds as bad as it is. If you love doggos as much as I do, you may want to look away. Fortunately, I have to stay here and tell you about this because it's my job. There have been some fantastic advancements in the field of science which has allowed things like organ transplants to be possible. Many, many lives have been saved. Vladimir Demikov was the first person to perform a successful coronary artery bypass operation on a warm blooded creature, but his studies in order to get there were nothing short of horrifying as you can guess by the title. He stitched the head and front legs of a puppy onto the neck of a German shepherd and he did this multiple times and it was a success each and every time. Both dogs could move independently and function quite well, however the tissue was rejected and out of his 20 subjects only one survived a full month. Even though this is one of the cruelest things I have ever seen in my life. This is the painful backstory behind how we as humans are able to have organ transplants and it's it's kind of insane and I don't know how I feel. Number 10, the FBI files on Bigfoot. Yeah, let's talk about those, why not? Because they exist apparently. Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch, had all of his FBI files released in response to the Freedom of Information Act back in 2019. The files contain correspondence between the FBI and individuals who claim to have evidence or sightings of Bigfoot from the 1970s all the way to the 1990s. The the FBI conducted limited analysis on some of these items submitted, including hair and tissue samples. We got some Bigfoot DNA. He's walking by, scratching, and we found a hair or two. They ultimately concluded that the samples were of no scientific value, but they're still files, which is terrifying. The files also contain internal memos discussing how to respond to calls about Bigfoot, but overall, the FBI's involvement with the creature was sadly quite minimal. I know, I want him to be real too. I really want him to exist. He'd be funny to bump into on the street with that goofy walk. He has a powerful stride, Bigfoot. Eh? He has like those, you know, it's all in the quads for him, for sure. Number nine, full house. During World War II, the United States and Britain, they would secretly create these maps, tiny little maps, these cheat sheets almost, that could help prisoners of war escape from German camps. Now these maps were then printed on thin paper and disguised as regular playing cards. How badass is that? The cards were designed so that they could be peeled apart to then reveal a detailed map of a specific area that would help prisoners navigate safely away, anywhere else is great. The decks were often given to prisoners by aid organizations or distributed by covert operatives, which I gotta say, what a scary job that would be. That's like some inglorious bastards type stress right there. Playing cards, dealing them out to the right people. That is so brave, oh my gosh. The fear of being caught, I couldn't even imagine. The plan was successful in helping many prisoners escape and it's considered a remarkable example of resourcefulness and bravery on all ends during a time of war. That's, again, I can't even shuffle cards, let alone do this. Are you kidding me? Number eight, Project Seesaw. In the 1960s, the US military explored the possibility of weaponizing lightning as part of a program called, you guessed it, Project Seesaw. Yeah, weaponizing lightning, like they're Thor, I guess. The goal was to use rockets to inject chemicals into thunderstorms, triggering lightning strikes that could then be directed towards enemy targets with thin wires. Now, it sounds insane, it definitely was, didn't quite work out. The project was ultimately, thankfully, abandoned due to technical and logistical challenges. Yeah, you can't predict where a lightning strike is gonna happen and the difficulty of accurately targeting them as well, 
it's not gonna work out. We're not Tony Stark. We're not doing the Avengers weaponry stuff. There's also concerns about the potential environmental impact of the program. Can't just send shit into clouds, guys. Despite its failure, Project Seesaw remains an example of how far humans will go in the name of warfare. Weaponized lightning? Listen to yourself. Number seven, Iran military dolphins. Back in the 1990s, Iran reportedly began training dolphins for military purposes, which sounds so crazy, it's almost funny in a way. I don't know, it reminds me of sharks with laser beams attached to their foreheads. Sounds made up, it sounds insane. These military dolphins are trained for many tasks, including detecting underwater mines, locating enemy divers, and identifying underwater obstacles. Again, kind of hilarious, kind of terrifying. The use of animals in military ops is sadly not new. With dolphins and sea lions, they've been trained before by various countries for harbor defense. However, the program in Iran has not been independently verified, and there is little information available about its current status. So, sleep in fear, I guess. These dolphins are off the radar. They're actually below the radar. Number six, Nimitz UFO. Back in 2004, a group of US Navy pilots led by Commander David Fraber encountered a unidentified, it was a UFO, found a UFO in the sky while conducting a training exercise right off the coast of California. This object was dubbed the Tic Tac, apparently displayed advanced capabilities that were unlike any known aircraft ever. In 2017, the Pentagon declassified these videos of the encounter and confirmed that it was part of a larger program called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. The incident sparked widespread interest and debate about the possibilities of extraterrestrial life existing and the government's role in investigating them. Yeah, what's, what's going on? I don't know. Comment down below. Do you believe in aliens? I kind of do. Be weird if you didn't, right? All that space out there. We're the only ones. Number five, Operation Snowbird. I thought losing my phone was bad. Huh, boy, here we go. Back in the 60s, a US Air Force plane carrying lots of nuclear materials, it crashed in the Himalayan mountains near the border between India and China. Just the thing you want. The crash site was difficult to access, obviously, where it crashed, and the US government mounted a secret mission codenamed Operation Snowbird. The mission was to recover the materials, I mean, ideally. The mission was hampered by the harsh terrain and altitude sickness among the recovery team. It was almost next to impossible. Although some of the plutonium was recovered, thankfully, a significant amount was left behind and still remains missing to this day. Number four, Big Brother is watching. Even allies of the United States aren't safe here. Thanks to Edward Snowden, at the end of October 2013, it was leaked that the states were spying on Germany, France, Spain, and even themselves. That's fun. The NSA had tapped into 35 phones. They were spying on 35 world leaders, not just random people. World leaders, that's pretty invasive. One of which was German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who called out the NSA after they found out and said that this act of snooping was just unacceptable between friends. That's a, that's a hard quote, that one hits the heart, really. Uh, but, 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 but. Now as you hear this, you're thinking, well, hey, Taylor, I'm not a world leader. What's the big deal here? What do I care? Well, it was also reported that the NSA was monitoring phone calls in Spain for the average folk. Apparently they monitored around 60 million calls in one month, randomly, so. Yeah, world leader or not. Better whisper on the phone, better hang up. It's still pretty jarring. Number three, leaked voters. Back in December 2015, pretty recent, scary, personal information from 191 million voters was all leaked to the public online. Researcher Chris Vickery found this data while conducting a security investigation. Now Forbes had described Vickery as, dare I say, a good hacker because they exist. They're called white hat hackers. They find weak spots in security without sabotaging or exploiting them. That's pretty cool. It's like some Tony Stark stuff. That's the Donnie difference right there. They don't ruin the world. 79% of those eligible to vote were the victims here. All their names, addresses, birth dates, phone numbers, and emails, even those stupid emails you had back in the day, you name it. Things you don't want other people finding out was all let to the public. And it was all let out to third parties. We're still unsure who was behind this entire leak. I mean, if you have any hints, comment down below. Tag them, right? CSO online and databreaches.net suggested that the information here more than likely came from software provider called Nation Builder. But CEO Jim Gilliam announced that that was not the case and that they did not create the database. Although, People lie, so who really knows? He conceded that it is possible that some of the information it contains may have come from the data that they make available for free to campaigns. So a third party took it and then ran with it. That's terrifying. 
It's almost worse than if he leaked it himself. Number two, WikiLeaks Warlogs. Oh, this one was pretty big. I definitely remember this going down. In Stockholm, buried around 100 feet below street level is an old nuclear bunker. Today, it's a facility owned by Swedish internet provider Banoff. Now this is where they keep servers for WikiLeaks. Yeah, pretty important, pretty spooky stuff. Julian Assange, front runner of this whole operation, his hard drive is in this bunker. It's stored behind a two foot steel door accompanied by numerous backup generators. So it's not going anywhere and you're definitely not getting it, no way. In October 2010, WikiLeaks actually published army field reports from earlier, back in 2004. Now, one of the biggest leaks in US history. This report confirmed that there were over 66,000 civilian deaths in the Iraq war logs, out of the 109,000 in total. This leak also suggested that some American troops were classifying civilians as enemies in their statistics, which changes a lot of things, changes a lot of numbers around, looks not great. These numbers were from 2004 to 2009 alone. It was a big leak. And finally, number one, hide your money. Putting your money in your mattress sounds a lot safer than, well, how I'm about to finish. Let's do it. Back in 2016, journalists all over the world were looking into the Panama Papers. Basically, it was a plethora of leaked documents, just a, a loot bag of all things bad. These all came from a law firm, Mossack Fonseca. Now, the operation here was that the firm would help the super rich hide their money in these offshore tax havens. And before you ask, Yes, they got caught, and yes, this whole thing was shut down. In total, there were 140 politicians from 50 countries who were all in on it. They were all busted, including the Saudi Arabian Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, and Iceland's former Prime Minister, Sigmundur David Gunnlaugsson. Mm -hmm. 